Okay. All right. Well, welcome everyone. It's uh, thanks for joining us over Zoom. Um, I wish we could all be in person, but you know, it's not that easy. And we've all, I think it's, we've all got comfortable being on Zoom because you guys can wear sweatpants. I can't wear sweatpants because I'm not wearing but, um, <clears throat> So tonight uh, is going to be a little different from our usual conversations. We are covering a topic that we felt would be better addressed and illuminated by the experts. We will be learning about how race has affected and continues to affect housing inequality right here in Connecticut. Uh, and that in turn impacts economic, health, and countless other outcomes for people. Hopefully you will all walk away better informed about the state of housing and what role you can play in moving things forward in our state. Uh, before we start, I just want to go over our usual conversation norms and agreements because even though this isn't as much of a conversation, there'll be stuff happening in the chat and we'll be having Q&A afterwards. Um, and I just like to set the tone for the space. So thank you, citizen, for taking part in this conversation. In the name of change, we deem this meeting a raw, safe, and vulnerable space. We ask that participants be as transparent as possible about themselves and their experiences, so these conversations may get heavy. We understand things may get quiet and or awkward, and that's okay. Let's honor those moments while keeping the conversation flowing. Please familiar, familiarize yourself with the agreements below to ensure that you and other participants can be heard. I should share my screen. I'm just realizing this. It's been a while. There we go. Um, keep your mic muted if you are not speaking. If you would like to speak, raise your hand. Um, use an emoji or type in the chat. Please wait for one of our facilitators to call on you before speaking. Each of us is participating in this conversation to listen and learn. Do not undermine or disrupt the experience of the conversation. While we respect the right to different perspectives, in this space we acknowledge and stand against racism, and we have gathered in a shared commitment to work against it. Every uh, Number three, every person's presence has value. We all have something to offer. Four, we aim to address behaviors, ideas, and choices, not who people are. Five, try to be understanding. Listen to the words of others, whether you agree or not. If you are not able to understand their perspective, ask yourself why. What is blocking my understanding? What if this person was a loved one? Whenever possible, use I statements rather than you statements. Try to respond with yes and also rather than no or but. Give everyone a chance to speak. Facilitators will kindly ask folks to finish up if necessary. If you cannot abide by these agreements, you may be removed from the meeting in the interest of keeping the safe space and this space safe and productive. So thank you everyone for letting me have my little spiel. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and introduce our panelists this evening. Uh, we have Taniqua Hughley, as, uh, who's the Outreach Director for Open Communities Alliance. We also have Sam Giffen, who is the Policy and Data Analyst for Open Communities Alliance. Now, Open Communities Alliance, or OCA, it works with uh, an urban-suburban interracial coalition to promote access uh, to opportunity for all people through education, advocacy, research, and partnerships. We also have Nick Abbott, who is the Deputy Coordinator for Desegregate CT. Desegregate CT is the coalition of neighbors and nonprofits advocating for more equitable, affordable, and environmentally sustainable land use policies in Connecticut, with a focus on expanding the diversity and supply of our housing stock. And then we have Ann Faust, who is the executive director of the Coalition on Housing and Homelessness, uh, which strives to end all types of homelessness in Middlesex County, Meriden, and Wallingford by increasing access to stable and affordable housing ensuring individuals and families are able to secure shelter, and by increasing collaboration and civic engagement to address housing issues in our region, which is what we're doing tonight. Um, so like I said earlier, we will have time for some Q&A at the end of the presentations, but feel free to use the chat to ask your questions throughout. Um, I'll read them on your behalf during the Q&A if you would not like to speak, but you will also be able to unmute and ask questions during the Q&A. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Taniqua um, from Open Communities Alliance. Awesome. Good evening, everyone. As Leah said, my name is Taniqua Hughley. I am the Outreach Director for Open Communities Alliance. Um, it would have been great to come out to Wallingford and see you all in person, but this is okay. It's okay. Um, so I'm going to kick us off and I'll share my screen in a bit um, with a little bit of the history and background um, information on 
a housing segregation and, and what that looks like here in Connecticut. And then I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Sam, who will talk about uh, one of our new proposals. Um, and so feel free to ask questions in the chat um, and or use the, um, the Q&A time toward the end. Um, but please feel free, if you have questions, you feel like you're gonna forget it, just put it in the chat. Um, so again, thank you. Okay, let's share my screen. Okay, and if I'm looking to the side, it's because I'm working off of multiple screens, so I apologize. I am still here looking at you all. So um, thank you for having us for the conversation on race, and, um, and we are participating in the expert panel on housing inequality. Um, Leah shared our mission for OCA, so I'll just reiterate that we work with um, a coalition that our, all of our coalition members live in both urban and suburban um, neighborhoods, and we really focus on, on choice and uh, promoting um, housing opportunities in, in all neighborhoods throughout the state. So I'll start off by saying um, that Connecticut is one of the most segregated states in the country. Um, and if you heard if you heard me present on the history, some of these things may be a little repetitive, um, but I'm going to switch it up and, and make sure that I share some long for data with you as well. Um, but yes, Connecticut is one of the most segregated states in the country. A lot of people are like, that's not true. How? Like, where did you get that information? Um, and it's unfortunate, right? Um, here in Connecticut and New England, we are more segregated than some states in the South. Um, and this is caused by multiple things, um, one being zoning, right? Um, and the location of subsidized housing, which I will talk a little bit about, uh, just the constant disinvestment in communities um, in Connecticut, uh, such as Hartford, such as Bridgeport and some of those um, cities that are um, are uh, cities of concentrated poverty, um, and then and then what I'll talk a little bit about is just the overall um, history of intentional segregation. Um, and I'm going to move a little fast just because I'm I'm sharing some time with my colleague. But again, ask questions, and if I don't get to answer you today, um, I will follow up with you via email. Um, this is our out of balance report. Sam, if you have the chance, can you just Put the link to the out of balance report in the in the chat. Um, a few years ago, we had the opportunity to create this out of balance report that really explored what opportunity is and what opportunity looks like in the state of Connecticut. And so we answer some of these um, core questions uh, that you may have. What are the areas of Connecticut that are struggling? What is causing this? segregation? Um, is the, the location of government subsidized housing allowing lower income families to connect to high opportunity towns and high performing school districts? So it's a really helpful tool. Um, please check it out if you can. So um, Open Communities Alliance, we, uh, we started this, we didn't start this, but we here in Connecticut, um, we launched um, opportunity maps, which we'll get to see. Um, and our opportunity maps are based off of uh, these factors of um, opportunity, that, excuse me, these factors um, which allow us to create those opportunity maps. And so here you can see, that um, to create our, our education, excuse me, to create our opportunity maps, we use the factors of education. So the medium income um, and the school ratings, uh, we use employment. So not just the unemployment rate, but employment access. We also talk about uh, the real job, retail job access and job growth. And then a neighborhood um, factor covers crime rates, home ownership rates and poverty. So when we get all of these together, these three factors together, that allow us to create an opportunity score. And so the opportunity score allows us to, um, excuse me, the opportunity score is designated into five different levels, rating from very low to very high. And so using those numbers, we then created this opportunity map. And so um, from very, very low to very high opportunity, you can see a disparity here throughout the state. The darker the orange, it means that those towns are more um, likely to thrive, right? Low unemployment rates, um, high, um, high job access, um, thriving schools, low crime rates um, compared to the low, very low, very low, low and moderate opportunity areas where uh, folks are more likely to experience homelessness, um, crime rates are more likely to be higher, um, and more folks are likely to be unemployed. And so 
with that map, we are often, we are able to layer race. Um, we're able to layer uh, the health disparity in Connecticut. And Sam, again, I'm gonna ask you for one more favor. If you can drop um, a link in the chat that shares all of our maps, our, all of our opportunity maps are interactive, which you can, um, you can play with on our, our website. And so we have the general opportunity map. We have a mobility app that allows folks to see how much, if they have a voucher, a housing voucher, it allows them to see how much their voucher is worth in different towns. Um, our health disparity map allows you to see um, the asthma rates. Um, it allows you to see the um, life expectancy rates as well. And so this map here is our um, the location of the physical subsidized units in the state of Connecticut. Um, and so this is based off of the preservation list. And if anyone knows, the preservation list is not um, as complete here in the state of Connecticut. So this is an estimate, but this is uh, more of a, a pretty ac accurate description of where subsidized housing is located. And so this map um, and with each layer, so the location of subsidized housing units, and um, here with the distribution of people of color, you can see that the concentrated poverty is happening in all of the very low and low opportunity areas. So just to show you the difference. And this is where the um, subsidized housing units are located in the state. So where do we live in Connecticut? 75% um, of um, the white race in, in Connecticut live outside of the very low and low opportunity areas compared to 74% of black households that live in the low and very low um, opportunity areas in the state. So 2% of the land area in the state is considered very low. Um, and more, almost more than half, um, excuse me, almost half of Blacks and, and Hispanic folks in the state of Connecticut live in that 2% of the state that is considered um, to be very low opportunity. So this is just a zoomed in um, picture of the New Haven County area so that you can get an idea of what opportunity looks like um, in, in your county. And so Longford by the numbers um, here, this is um, a breakdown of race um, where Longford compared to the general New Haven County area and the state of Connecticut. Uh, so you can see 84% of uh, white people live in Longford compared to 1%, one and a half percent of black people and 8.4% of Hispanic folks that live in Longford. So what I'm really going to talk about here is, is access, like who, who lives in Longford, right? Who has access to Longford? And so Sam will share a little bit more about um, how we can change that and how we can make Connecticut a more integrated place. And so here, this is um, a description of the percent of single family homes and the percent of affordable homes in, um, in Longford, New Haven County in Connecticut. So you can see that only 4%, 4.3% of the homes in, or housing um, in housing stock in Longford is affordable compared to 13% in Connecticut. And so some of the quick solutions, um, and I'll pass it over to Sam is overall, is that you know in a state, we need to invest in the struggling communities. We need to ensure that those communities that are struggling where you saw the um, concentrated poverty, that those folks, those residents have the same access to resources as those who live in Wallingford um, or Orange or Woodbridge or any of those um, other towns in, in New Haven County. And also we want to ensure that um, there are affordable housing choices in um, high opportunity areas, which Sam will talk a little bit about. And with that said, um, Sam, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Taniqua, and thanks everyone for being here tonight. Um, obviously, there's so much that we could talk about um, in such a short period of time. Um, I just want to extend, as Taniqua did, um, the offer to continue this conversation either by email or having more events like this. Um, OC has been around for about seven years, um, having this very conversation in communities around Connecticut. So um, it's what we do, and, and we're proud to do it. I'm going to be talking a little bit about the policy that 
um, OCA has, after you know five or so years, um, oh sorry, I'm trying to share my presentation, um, come to the conclusion that is the most effective nationally and the most effective way to get Connecticut to a um, a place of greater housing equality, and it's called fair share. Um, for starters, um, if you lived in Connecticut in 2020, uh, you are aware that zoning is a pretty big issue and a hot fed issue, um, one that a lot of people care about passionately on many different sides. Um, we started this effort by a couple of years ago um, by looking at what uh, policies around the country have made an impact um, in overcoming exclusionary zoning. So zoning that excludes um, the type of housing that would allow people access to a place, um, particularly a, a high opportunity um, place. Um, and there are a lot of different versions of this type of law. There's a Connecticut law, or there, there's a version um, in Connecticut, um, not a fair share law, but something that attempts to get housing, affordable housing built um, where it's currently not very built. Uh, California has a law, New Jersey has a law. And what we decided is that, um, or what we found in the research is that New Jersey's system, the fair share system um, has actually produced the greatest amount of housing um, of any policy across the country. Um, and so we learned from that opportunity um, and, and decided to create a policy that um, brought the best elements of fair share in New Jersey to Connecticut, um, but of course making it work for Connecticut. Basically what a fair share is, um, is the recognition that every town has a responsibility to reach its fair share of the housing need. Now what's the housing need? That's the first step in the process. Um, typically affordable housing is decided or defined as housing which doesn't cost more than 30% of a household's income. Um, However, uh, the situation gets much, much worse as you go down an income spectrum. So AMI is the area median income. Um, and so there are almost half a million households in Connecticut that are paying more than 30% of their household income um, towards housing. But we're not worried about the millionaire that's doing that. So we start looking um, further down the income spectrum, 80% AMI, which is the technical um, HUD cutoff for low income, 50% um, AMI and down to 30% AMI, which is considered extremely low income. Um, for example, in the New Haven uh, metro area, that's about $30,000 for a family of four yeah, annually. And cost burden, um, is, it's a serious issue because you have less to spend on education, on transportation, on other aspects of life that you need. Um, but the unfortunate fact is that uh, severe cost burden is actually rampant in the state. So that means a household spending more than half of their income on just housing alone. And at 30% of AMI, so about $30,000 a year for a family of four, um, that spending greater than half of that $30,000 a year on just housing, there are 135,000 households in the state um, that fit that description. This is an extreme need situation. Obviously, it doesn't describe the entire need in the state, but that's what we use as our baseline to, um, to start developing a fair share plan that can eat away at that um, need. So the fair in the fair share comes from the allocation process. Um, and any good allocation process, taking that regional need um, and allocating it to towns um, will consider the history uh, it will consider how well towns have done to create economic diversity, um, to build multifamily housing. Um, all of these are actually embedded in Connecticut's law. So this is where we departed from New Jersey and we said, let's make this really intrinsic to Connecticut's statutes. Um, so Connecticut General Statute 8-2, the Zoning Enabling Act, um, requires that zoning enable multifamily housing and encourage income diversity. Um, and meets the regional need. There's actually that language. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we also, because of our mission, understand the um, impact over the century of inequitable housing and racial housing discrimination that um, 
This has led to inequity in the wealth and income in different places. So that should be incorporated as well. Um, but of course, we're not just simply trying to cast, make, you know, build housing where there is less need. So there's a, a regional market um, planning sense to it as well. Combining those four factors in relative proportion to, um, to towns in your region um, spits out some pretty big numbers. Uh, as you can see, the Wallingford um, fair share would be 2,082 uh, units over the next 10 years of affordable housing. Um, and um, that is fairly sizable. I, I think it's more than obviously uh, Wallingford has ever considered building. But when you put it in the context of just in the New Haven um, or the South Central Connecticut Council of Governments, that there are 26,000 households that are extremely low income and severely cost burdened. Um, so the income metric that I, that I cited before, um, that seems like a pretty reasonable fair share for a town, the Wallingford, the, the size of Wallingford and, and Wallingford has more multifamily housing than, than do a lot of towns in the region. Um, it also has perhaps a larger grand list than some, perhaps it has, um, maybe a, a lower poverty rate than some. So um, that's kind of how we get the regional need distributed. Uh, and just to show what could happen under the best case scenario, um, if fair share were to be passed in Connecticut. Um, again, we look back at the New Jersey experience um, where to this day, and this is obviously a bit outdated, um, you see 65,000 affordable units constructed in New Jersey in that time frame. Um, and that is with almost a decade of the governor of New Jersey trying to destroy the program. Um, 65,000 units of affordable housing being built and many more thousands, tens of thousands since 2014. It's actually increasing at the rate, um, uh, increasing at the rate that, or increasing, it's the rate of production, has, production of affordable housing is increasing. Um, and the economic impacts of this would be massive. Um, obviously, people know that Connecticut is an expensive place to live. It's got a huge um, affordability problem across the income spectrum, um, but people are leaving Connecticut and the economy is stagnating and businesses don't wanna locate here because they can't provide, um, or they can't find labor across the labor spectrum that they need. Um, so the economic impact would be measured in the tens of billions of dollars, not just in local and state tax revenue um, from these units being built, um, but from the money that would be spent in the Connecticut economy um, if these units were built. Um, it's a very complicated policy and I tried to boil it down to a very short presentation. So I look forward to your questions and uh, probably a necessary follow-up discussion, but thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Fran. And, uh, and like you said, just uh, start putting stuff in the chat if you have questions or you can hold it to the end, that's fine. Um, so with that, fantastic and very uh, information heavy, but fascinating um, presentation. We're gonna move on to Nick Abbott from Desegregate CT. Great, Th thanks so much for having us. And yeah, um, happy to be here with other panelists and to build on uh, Taniqua and Sam's great uh, presentation. I've got a presentation myself, which hopefully, uh, which yeah, I, I know will not, will not overlap and hopefully complement some of the information we just heard, uh, but likewise happy to answer in, uh, any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. So just briefly about who we are as an organization. Uh, we're a new group, we were founded in June, 2020. That's a made up of a coalition of different organizations and uh, really organizing around reforming the land use laws that Sam and Taniqua talked about, which in Connecticut are particularly restrictive, which we'll, I'll talk a bit more about. Our activities really focus on three key areas, one of which is education, doing a lot of events like this, the second of which is doing research. So that means doing our own research into zoning codes and uh, related outcomes in Connecticut, but also summarizing some of the best nationwide research on land use laws and zoning and segregation. And then finally doing advocacy for smart reforms, uh, particularly at the statewide level in Connecticut, since that's where we think the most action is needed as, as Sam was talking about, but also at the local level. 
So I mentioned at the top that we're a coalition-based organization, uh, which means that our direction and our policies and our activities are directed by the groups that are part of our coalition. You see a smattering of them here. Some are housing-specific groups. Others are environmental groups who know that land use policy really touches uh, climate goals. Others are economic groups, whether it be for business development and home building or labor groups that recognize that this issue really affects them too. So it's a, a broad spectrum of different organizations that recognize this is imperative um, and land use reform is imperative, not just because it's the right thing to do, but it's the smart thing to do. I think what we're particularly proud of in the past year is so many different groups, including this one, um, have started having really important conversations about race uh, in Connecticut uh, and nationwide. And really in Connecticut, there's, there's so many issues that uh, we need to deal with, but housing is one of the most pernicious and distinctive to Connecticut, which is why you also see a lot of racial justice groups involved in their coalition as well. So just in terms of informing where we come to this conversation from, um, you know, Tanika talked a little bit about some of the origins of, of zoning. And I think we start here, which is to say that we've outlawed a lot of the causes of segregation. And this is by no means an exhaustive list, and it's also not a list that means that the things that are crossed out here, which have been outlawed by federal and state legislation or by judicial rulings, it doesn't mean that those things have gone away. But what it does mean is that um, some of the most, or the foremost historic causes of segregation, whether it be on the private side, real estate agents steering people to segregate in neighborhoods or discriminatory lending practices, or on the public side through policies of redlining that you might be familiar with, while we have outlawed those, we've really done a bad job or, or little job at all of outlining ex outlawing exclusionary zoning, which we know not only helped to cause segregation in the first place, maybe had a bit more of a secondary role, but it's helped to entrench and exacerbate segregation. And I think this quote from an amicus brief in a recent Supreme Court case really drives that home, which is that many suburban communities have locked in existing levels of racial exclusivity with zoning ordinances that may be not explicitly um, or even intentionally racially discriminatory, but end up having that effect by limiting the housing options available um, to people of lower incomes or disproportionately people of color uh, you know, throughout the country, but as we'll see in a second, particularly here in Connecticut. So looking at our state for a second, one thing we spent a lot of time on is researching all of the zoning codes in Connecticut. So um, OCA showed you some of their great opportunity mapping, which is, which is a great project. And, and we've you know, really learned from some of the great um, data work that's been done by different groups throughout the state in putting together this project, which looked at each of the zoning jurisdictions in Connecticut, of which there are 180. There are actually more places with the power to zone than there are, than there are towns in Connecticut, which we have 169. And in each of those towns or municipalities or cities, um, they will have multiple zoning districts. So in Connecticut in total, there are over 2,600 zoning districts that may allow different types of housing, different sizes of housing and set all sorts of different rules. So what we set out to look at was, um, you know, where is multifamily housing allowed in our state? And in particular, where is it allowed as of right, meaning without a special permitting process, because we know when that's required, very little, if any, multifamily housing is built. And what we found is that in over 90% of our state, you can build a single family home without a special permit, but you can only build four family housing, which is pretty small. It's not a large apartment building. In fact, it may look the exact same as a single family home. You can only build that in 2% of our state, which is vanishingly small and means that the people who can afford a single family home, as Taniqua talked a little bit about, are very limited geographically in terms of where they can access housing. We also know that another tool that limits, opportun uh, limits opportunity and access to many neighborhoods are minimum lot sizes. So in 80% of Connecticut's residential land, um, you have to own an acre or more of land to build a home. And obviously, if you can't afford an acre of land, which is a lot of land, you won't be able to afford to live there. In addition to having drastic affordability consequences um, and the knock-on segre uh, segregative consequences that has, has drastic environmental consequences as well by 
causing us to sprawl out further, limiting development in areas where we already have the infrastructure to support it, and pushing us further away from job centers and transit. So this is, is a screenshot from the, the zoning atlas that I've been showing, and I'll, I'll be sure to drop that in the chat for Wallingford in particular. Um, as you can see, Wallingford actually tracks about the state um, in the graphic on the right in terms of where four family housing is allowed. It's about 2% of the town's area. Wallingford is doing somewhat better with minimum lot sizes. It does have smaller minimum lot sizes, particularly in areas that are connected to water and sewer, which is a good thing, although still sets a minimum of an acre or more on 60% of its residential land, which is, um, you know, we think you know, beyond what is necessary to protect whatever interests are necessary in setting minimum lot sizes. And you'll see here that, you know, there's a strong correlation between some of the maps I was showing above. This is uh, in the New Haven area between what zoning allows and the share of units that are single family. So here you'll see in New Haven, um, which allows a lot of multifamily housing, there are very few single family units, whereas in the surrounding towns, it's almost all single family housing, very few other options for people who can't afford a single family home. It's actually a map shown in, in Tanika's uh, presentation around segregation and in the, around the country showing Connecticut has among the highest levels of segregation. And what's particularly concerning to us is that this has actually gotten worse over time. So in 1968, the United States Congress passed the Fair Housing Act but since then, our three major metropolitan areas have actually gotten more segregated by race. And what we know is that even when we've gotten rid of those formal types and ex explicit means of discrimination I highlighted at the top, our zoning laws are one of the foremost barriers that have caused segregation to persist and really get worse as this data indicates. We also know this one of the impacts this has is on uh, school achievement and access to good schools. So this is from a Brookings report, which shows the school test score gap between high achieving schools and low achieving schools within metropolitan areas. And uh, Connecticut has three of the highest school test score gaps of any metropolitan areas in the country, three of the top four. And what you see on the right is that this is strongly cor correlated with zip code segregation um, between low income students on the one hand going to poorly performing schools and middle and higher income students who are able to attend higher performing schools because of where they live. And what we also know from the same report is that there's a strong correlation between this test score gap, housing cost gap, which is the difference in cost between living near a high performing school and a low performing school and the restrictiveness of zoning in particular areas. So you'll see here on the right, uh, the Bridgeport area has, according to this measure, the, high, the most restrictive zoning of any metropolitan area in the country, actually tied with the Hartford metropolitan area. And as a result, the difference in cost for what it costs to live near a high-performing school in, let's say, Greenwich or Darien versus a low-performing school in Bridgeport is drastic, 3.5 times as much. I touch on, on the environmental impacts, and I know I want to leave plenty of time for uh, Anne to talk about her work. So I'll, I'll zip past a couple of the environmental points here to talk a little bit about reform efforts and complementing Sam's presentation. So as I said at the top, we really think there's a need for statewide reform here. We know that localities acting on their own, even if they want to do the right thing, can't do enough individually. It requires all of us working together. We also know that, frankly, a lot of municipalities aren't incentivized to do the right thing, especially when, you know, matters of racial segregation and lack of affordability are matters of statewide concern that extend beyond municipal boundaries. These three buckets outline kind of a rough categorization of some state level reforms, which we won't get too much into. You'll see on the far, and there's actually a fair amount of overlap between some of these different reforms. You'll see on the far right, uh, mentions the fair share plan, um, which is, uh, you know, uh, a concept that Sam talked about, the builder's remedy, which might be familiar to people here, uh, which is Connecticut's 830G law, which gives builders the ability to override local zoning um, in certain instances when they set aside a certain percentage of units in their development as affordable housing. 
Something we've focused a lot upon is preemption, um, which is to emphasize uh, in particular towns with exclusionary zoning or to limit the town's ability to enact exclusionary zoning laws um, that are inconsistent with sound planning principles and interests of the state. At the local level, we've also seen some encouraging signs here. Um, many towns have outlawed single family zoning, uh, cities like Portland, Oregon, Minneapolis, Sacramento, and permitted middle housing, which I'll show in a graphic in a second. They've lowered their minimum lot sizes in Houston to 1,400 square feet, which is uh, much, much, much smaller than an acre, which is 40,000 square feet. And in other places, we've seen other positive reforms, reforming parking requirements to allow for denser and more housing, permitting requirements to ensure we can actually build more housing quicker, and upzoning to increase the density of areas, particularly near our downtowns and our transit stations. This graphic shows, um, I talked a little bit about replacing single family zoning, which is to say, there's a lot of room between just allowing only detached single family homes and allowing mid-rise apartment buildings, which to be clear, we need to allow a lot more of in Connecticut. But in between those two, there's a lot of types of housing that are currently banned in Connecticut, including duplexes, multiplexes, townhomes, for which there's robust demand um, on the demand side and for which there's willing builders eager to build the supply, but which regulatory constraints prevent from being built. Um, and so we know that when we build a lot more of this type of housing, it's likely to be more affordable than the single family housing, uh, than you know, uniform single family housing. It creates opportunities for larger developments, which can include set asides of affordable units. And it also makes us more sustainable by building more housing near infrastructure that can support it rather than forcing sprawl. One reform that we're particularly proud of is a bill that passed last year, which we regard as a, a first step in the right direction, which is a modest set of reforms codified in HB 6107. Um, I won't get too much into the details of that bill, but I'll drop a link into the chat about all the things that are in there. Um, it includes requiring towns to allow for accessory dwelling units, to cap their parking requirements, to affirmatively further fair housing, which is a fairly significant requirement that I think actually OCA has done a lot of positive advocacy on, which we're very thankful for, as well as lots of myriad other requirements that put the onus on municipalities to engage in more um, sound, fairer, and equitable planning practices. Looking forward, we're you know, eager to build upon the first step of that bill passing with continued action. Um, you know, certainly passing any bill is really hard uh, in the legislature and particularly in Connecticut known as the state of the land of steady habits. Uh, we don't expect that's going to get easier anytime soon. But we do think we've got strong momentum um, on this issue. We've got a lot of people interested, including all the people on this call who are calling attention to it and telling their legislators that this is an important issue to them, which is so important. Um, and we've got an energized coalition of organizations that I talked about at the top with diverse interests that have coalesced around zoning reform as something that's really important to them. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up, um, hand it off to, to Leah and to Anne, but also happy to answer any questions or to follow up via email with anybody. Thanks for having me. Anne, you're still muted, so. <laughs> There we if I had a dime for every any time anyone told me that. Um, yes, so um, thank you so much for the great presentations that preceded me. Um, I'm going to bring it down a little to the local level. And um, the Coalition for Housing works on a continuum of housing, everything from trying to create more affordable units to working with the homeless response system. Um, and, you know, people who are homeless or at risk of homeless, they're only a very, very small percentage of people who need affordable housing. I mean, there's so many single parents, older um, adults that need affordable housing. But we do know that people who are at risk of homelessness are um, disproportionately people of color. Uh, part of that is a lack of generational wealth. They don't have the safety nets that uh, you know that our kids have when the, when they hit a bump in the road, and a lot of that is because of um, a lack of access to home ownership. Um, that's one of the the 
easiest and, and greatest ways to create generational wealth. Um, but I did I did some research today with 211 and um, specifically on Wallingford and what the calls coming into 211 were in the last 90 days. And 26% of them, the highest percentage were calls for um, housing and shelter. And utilities were 8.6, which utilities really is a housing issue too. So together that makes 35 percent or in three months 238 people from Wallingford called 211 because they were having a housing crisis. Um, the next highest was mental health and addiction services at 22 percent. Um, but if you look if you break down the numbers for who was calling for housing and shelter about 20 percent were looking for low cost housing another 20 percent were looking for rental assistance but the largest proportion of people in Wallingford looking for housing assistance were for emergency shelter. Um, just think about that. It's 73 people from July 19th until today, 73 people from Wallingford called 211 saying they had no place to sleep tonight. And most of those people are, they're disproportionately people of color. Um, so we have vouchers with, with the resource recovery money. We have plenty of vouchers for people that um, provide the rental assistance they need based on their income and support services. And we can't find apartments. We have a log jam in our shelter system with people who have a voucher, but they just can't find a place to rent, even though their rent is guaranteed. Um, so, a lot of times, you know, people think of homelessness, what you see in the movies as someone who's chronically homeless with severe mental illness. On any given night, most of the people who are homeless, it's just a situation and they can get out of homelessness within 30 days, um, sometimes with no um, intervention at all. And a lot of times homelessness, it's, it really is just a question of money. They need a security deposit, first month's rent, an affordable place to live, and a landlord um, who will rent to them. Um, Zillow, you know, that site we go on to see how much our neighbor's house is sold for. Um, they have a lot of research that just scroll down to the bottom. And what they found is as rents increase, what was somebody, um, as, as rents increase, homelessness increases. Um, as people, as the median rent is over 30% of the median income, um, then homelessness increases. Uh, they did a study in Los Angeles where a 2% increase in rent led, led to an additional 4,000 people who were homeless. Um, so, you know, how does this affect you? Why would creating affordable housing in Wallingford benefit you? Um, besides it being the morally right thing to do, which I think we all know. Um, a lot of times people who are homeless in the wintertime, they wind up in the emergency department. It creates longer waits at the emergency department. It, it costs more, um, obviously. There's, there was a famous study in Reno um, that we replicated right here in our region of the million dollar Murray, a, a person who, who cost um, in social services, in hospital bills, um, uh, residential treatment facilities, criminal justice system. Over a 10 year period, Murray cost um, taxpayers a million dollars. We had a grad student at UConn that found our own million dollar Murray who went from Mid-State Hospital to Middlesex Hospital and bounced around. Um, once Million Dollar Murray was given a housing voucher in, in an apartment he could afford and was stable, his cost to taxpayers was less than $20,000 a year. Same, same, we got the same results here in our region that it went from $100,000 a year of taxpayer and hospital bills to $20,000. Um, Michael Burrell, he, he's a person who's been homeless in our region and is stably housed and he speaks and advocates for us. And um, when he gives his speech about how, how he became um, stably housed with a, with a twinkle in his eye, he says, I used to be a real expensive guy, but I'm getting cheaper every day. Um, and he is, he did, he, he is less expensive. Um, his, his quality of life has improved, his health has improved. Um, so Wallingford has a lot going for it. Um, you have a great 
social service network that we meet monthly um, that's organized by the library. You have SCOW, which is an amazing organization. Your housing authority in Wallingford is one of the best, most progressive housing authorities in the state. They've got a great board and a great staff. Um, so you have a lot of assets. It makes me really hopeful that Wallingford can actually um, tackle this issue. Um, so what, what you can do, um, again, in other parts of the country, young people have started groups called YIMBYs. Um, we all know that a, a NIMBY is a, a not in my backyard. There's groups of YIMBYs out there and they organize happy hours and they proactively, um, some people think that's not a word, but they, <laughs> they proactively go to planning and zoning meetings and say, we, we want um, less restrictive zoning in our town. They don't wait until there's a controversial project in front of planning and zoning. So um, I know there's, I know people under 40, they're very busy and they're time strapped, but if they could find the time to create a YIMBY organization and be vocal, I, I think that was part of Desegregate Connecticut's success as they got so many young people in there advocating to their town. Um, we all know people, um, you know, I, I live um, outside of Wallingford and my kids and some of their friends, they couldn't find a rental in my town and they felt very unwelcome. Um, so that, that's a, a message I think that people in Wallingford need to hear. Um, so educate yourself. Um, and again, Desegregate Connecticut has a Mythbusters section of their website. You know, there's all these myths, um, the crowded school myth, the property values myth, the higher taxes myth, the neighborhood character myth. Um, high traffic, high crime, all those are myths and they've been debunked by study after study. So when you're at a barbecue and somebody brings up some of these myths, um, speak up and say, no, that, that's not true. Uh, most people that live in rental housing do not have lots of kids, actually less kids than single family housing. Um, you know, it's the decisions we made in the 80s to zone Connecticut, um, you know, single family houses on large lots that really created, um, uh, created towns that encourage large families to move in. Um, so, um, so again, just educate yourself, speak up. Um, you know, uh, get on your zoning planning and zoning commission, especially you people under 40, we need you to be represented on planning and zoning commissions on, on city councils and boards of selectmen. I know it's a very difficult to, thing to do, especially in this town of time of polarization on social media, but your voice really needs to be heard. Um, we, we really need to get on these planning and zoning commissions. Um, and you know, if there's any, this right now we're in the middle of municipal elections. If there are candidates forums, which I would, I kind of think the library maybe might be involved in some candidates forums coming up. Ask questions about housing. Um, make people go on record for for how they think and, and um, what they would do to support our efforts. Um, it, it has worked. Desegregate Connecticut in a year got, got a bill passed. It wasn't everything we wanted, but it was much more than I ever thought would happen. Um, this really is an exciting time to be advocating for more housing choices. Um, it's, it's good for the people who live in Wallingford. It's good for the people who want to live in Wallingford. Um, so please um, advocate, get involved. Um, in your local politics. I think that's where we can make the greatest change is, is in your, your local planning and zoning commissions. And, um, and, I, and I just wanted to take a shout out too to libraries. I mean, libraries have been uh, become a de facto social service network for many towns. And you guys have a really great li library in Wallingford that treats everybody with dignity. So um, that's another thing Wallingford should be very proud of. <laughs>